Father, we are just so grateful, so grateful for the privilege of worshiping your name, the privilege of worshiping your son and worshiping your spirit. And Lord, this morning as we, as we are worshiping you corporately as your church, uh, we pray what we have prayed many times before, we, we pray that your word would cause growth, that your word would be fruitful. You promised that your word would never be ineffective, futile, and vain. It will always accomplish the purpose for which you send it forth. And you even invite us to come and buy wine and come and buy bread without money, without cost. And you promise that the, the rains from heaven are like the, your word, which will cause growth. And so, Lord, our sustenance can only come from you. We cannot live uh, by bread alone, but we live by every word that proceeds from your mouth. And so this morning, Lord, it's no different. We're here as your church, and we, we want to hear from you. And I pray, Lord, that we would benefit from the encouragement and the conviction and the, the, the confrontation of a, a profound story from Christ's life, that it would impact us and that we would learn what we must learn, that we would learn what the disciples had to learn. And that as a result, Lord, that we would be a fearless people. Lord, I pray this morning that you would produce in us a fearlessness, such a profound confidence in you, in your character, your identity, your promises, your word, your gospel, that there would be no threat that could cause us to step back, that there would be no threat that could produce compromise, that there would be a true fearlessness in the face of cost and in the face of the world. And I pray that we as your people would walk out of here changed, and that change wouldn't even be measured by some sort of sense of a lesson learned, but it would be measured, I pray, by an actual fearlessness, an actual confidence in who you are. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to invite you to take your seat, and as you are sitting down, you can turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. We are looking at this incredible gospel, um, and hopefully, uh, hopefully the longer we're in the gospel of Mark, the less you will indict me for saying that it's my favorite book in the Bible. Uh, hey, it's what I'm preaching, so of course it's my favorite book in the Bible, but it is one that I kind of come back to. It's, it's more often my favorite book of the Bible than other books of the Bible, maybe. But uh, I really am just thrilled with this study. Uh, it's, just, it, it's just incredible to be able to, week after week, just continue to dive into this incredibly vivid and incredibly brief gospel of Christ's life. And as we have studied it uh, for quite some time now, we are seeing story after story after story that's, that's doing different things. It's, it's bearing different weight or, or accomplishing different things in Mark's purposes as he's telling us about Christ's life. Overall, they combine to produce one effect, and that should be that every one of us are impressed and uh, enamored with and worshiping and adoring Jesus Christ the Lord as the Son of God. And when we come to grips with who Jesus Christ is as the Son of God, it changes everything. This passage that we're going to look at in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41, is a very familiar story. It's about Jesus calming the storm. The point of the story has to do with the disciples, and it documents that they have not quite come to full grips with embracing the identity of Jesus Christ. They know who he is, and they're glad to follow him, but when it comes to following Jesus Christ, if we're going to follow Christ on the way, on the path of discipleship, down the path that he has for us as his children, if we're going to follow him fearlessly, we have to be convinced of who he is. The disciples are still coming to grips with the identity of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And this is one of those notable points in their discipleship and their training, and it's, it's the first of many to come where their fear comes out. And when I say the word fear, as we're going to look at it this morning, Mark is not using the word fear 
And when Jesus asks them about their fear in verse 40, he's not talking about a reverential fear, a virtuous fear of God that changes the way you live because you're consumed with pleasing God and you're terrified of offending him. That's a virtuous fear of God. This is a fear that is a sinful fear. It produces timidity. It causes compromise. It slows you down in your, follow, your following and your discipleship of Jesus Christ. That's got to go. And the answer to that kind of fear is being convinced of who Christ is. And that's exactly what happens in this, in this story. We see, the, we see that they are coming to grips slowly with the reality of who Christ is. And in this story, their fear is on full display. And so my title this morning is Faith or Fear? And that's really the question, because that's the question Jesus asks of the disciples in verse 40. He says to them, why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? And so, Christian, faith and fear are opposites in this text. Again, he's not contrasting faith with the fear of the Lord, the virtuous fear. He's talking about being afraid. The fear that would cause us to compromises we try to follow Christ in this world, 2022. With all the threats, all the costs, all the consequences, there's fears that would prevent you from following hard after Christ, fears that could cause compromise in your own devotion to him. And the disciples are emulating that in this particular account. Let's dive in. I want to read from verse 35 to 41, the last story here in chapter 4. Mark writes, on that day when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? They became very much afraid. And they said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Mark's account is really unique in several details, and that's kind of typical of Mark's vivid storytelling. You're probably used to his vividness. Um, He is obviously getting his eyewitness details from Peter. We know that from church history. And there's several details here that aren't found in either Matthew or Luke. I found that kind of interesting. In verse 36, Mark records that the disciples took him just as he was, uh, which most likely means, uh, if we understand where we're at in the context of Mark 4, this particular story happens right on the heels of the parables. And you remember from chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus got into a boat in the sea and sat down, and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And so then he begins teaching in parables. And so the public preaching of the parables, basically everything in chapter 4 up to this story, excluding verses 10 through 20, everything else would have been a public preaching in parabolic fashion, teaching the, the, the massive crowd on the shore the, the explanation privately of the nature of parables and the interpretation of the parable of the soils would have happened privately with the disciples at some other later point. So everything besides verses 10 to 12 happens while Jesus is sitting in a boat. And so when you get to verse 36, Mark uniquely, I mean, this is information we don't have from anywhere else, sounds like they just up and left from that particular boat, just took him and went. And there were other boy, boats that joined them, and they didn't even go back to shore. They just took off and went across the uh, lake to the other side. Also in verse 35, Mark records that this is on that very day, which makes it obviously inarguable that um, this is the very same day that Jesus was preaching in parables to the public audience. In verse 36, uh, the third thing that's different is it says that there were other boats with them, and so it doesn't specify whether that's just the boats for the disciples or there's like a massive following, but obviously there was 
more than one boat. A lot of boats are, are following Jesus across the uh, lake. Uh, in, ver- uh, in verse 38, Jesus is sleeping on a cushion. No one else records that detail. No one else, actually, besides Mark, records the kind of the fearful sarcasm in verse 38. When the disciples wake him up, they say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? You know, the other Gospels record some content, but they don't record that kind of sarcastic, like, rebuke, almost like, like what's going on? Like, what, this should not be happening this way. And uh, that's an interesting insight uh, and an inst- interesting detail of, of what the disciples actually said that, that Mark alone gives us. And then finally, he's the only one who records the content of Jesus' rebuke. In verse 39. What's important for us this morning is to understand the implications of this story and benefit from what it's doing at this particular point in Mark's gospel. Um, This narrative kind of kicks off a section where Mark is beginning to document Jesus' power over nature in a a pretty systematic fashion. Um, Power over nature in verses 35 to 41. In our story, it's obviously water and wind, storm, natural causes, natural effects, the weather, that's all included. In the next story, chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, we see his power over demons. And in the last story of chapter 5, it's a story within a story. And the outer story is the story of um, the, 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 the young girl um, who died. And the inner story, that's this daughter of the synagogue official, the story within the story is the woman who is hemorrhaging. She has a, 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 she's bleeding, um, and Christ heals her. And so we see his power, in, if you put all these stories together, you see his power over nature, his power over demons, his power over disease, and his power over death. This is profound. The man, Jesus Christ, on earth, with power, personal power, over all of these forces. This is authority. And he's beginning to document this in a very systematic fashion. We've seen some of it already, especially the demons, and we saw the demoniac healed in the synagogue in chapter 1. It's interesting, even one commentator recognized that there is kind of even a a connection here in the nature of these stories starting in 435 all the way through the end of chapter 5. And if you think about it with the connection to uh, their their relationship to death, well, the disciples are are saved from near death. They're, They're close to death. They think they're going to die in the storm. And then in the chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, you've got the, the, the demoniac who is living among the dead. Mark actually documents that he is living in the tombs. So he's living in an unclean area, living among the dead. And then the woman who is bleeding, uh, he described her as a, the, the living dead, because Leviticus 7, 17 11 says that the life's in the blood. And so he mentions, well, she's, she's bleeding and she's not being healed. She's in a process of dying in a long-term sense. And then you get to the end of chapter 5, and the daughter of, the, of uh, uh, the, the, the ruler of the synagogue is actually dead. And so you can see this increasing, increasing sphere of power and authority and increasing directness to the connection to death, even as you watch these stories unfold. And so it's also um, interesting in this story, as we read these, the, the story from verse 35 to 41, you might have noticed that some of these details sound a little bit familiar. Now, this goes way back to Mark chapter 1, but if you remember, if you remember in the synagogue of Capernaum, Jesus was teaching one particular day, and a, a, de- a demon-possessed man starts yelling out, and there's some interesting parallels here. If you go back for a second to Mark chapter 1, I found this interesting even the way Mark tells it is, is a kind of a parallel fashion. There's a lot of parallels here. First of all, they both start with a question about personal demise. In fact, in verse 24, Mark chapter 1, verse 24, the demon-possessed man says, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And that word destroy is the exact same word, the same root word as what the disciples say in our our story in chapter 4 in verse 38. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? 
We're at the end. We're, be, we're about to be destroyed. And so the demons are asking about their destruction. The disciples are asking about their destruction. Both stories be, involve a rebuke. Jesus rebukes the demoniac. He rebukes the storm. Both of those rebukes, interestingly enough, involve the same word that's translated in, ver, in chapter 1, verse 25. Jesus says to the demoniac, to the demons specifically, uh, be quiet and come out of him. So now he's speaking directly to the demons, not the man. He's referring to the man third person, but you demons, be quiet, be silent. And in verse 39, Jesus silences the storm. Hush, be still. That second word is the same word from Mark, Mark 1, 25. Both stories end with a question about Jesus' teaching or his identity. If you look at Mark chapter 1, Notice what happens. Everybody who's in synagogue that day, they just show up for synagogue. They expect another teaching from a rabbi, and they walk out, and they're saying, uh, verse 27, they were amazed. And what they're saying to one another is, what is this? It's a new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And uh, we, we talked about that when we studied that, that passage. They were actually more impressed with his teaching. They were like, what is this, this teaching? With authority, and he's even casting out demons. And so the authority, obviously, is you can't separate the authority of his teaching from the authority that he had over demons. It's the same authority. But they were impressed by the teaching and shocked by the authority over the demons. You go to our story, and um, the question is on the lips of the disciples. In verse 41, the disciples say, who then is this? Well, I mean, where have you been in this story, disciples? I mean, this is Jesus of Nazareth, and that's the point. Mark is documenting that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. It's the theme of this, this whole gospel. And so when the disciples are asking, who is this, they don't, they're not lacking a name, they're not even lacking the title Son of God, but it's clear that they are struggling to come to grips with the implications of that reality. You know, there's a really obvious disconnect between this story and the demoniac from Mark chapter 1. Remember what the demon said? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The demons were convinced of Jesus' identity. In fact, you have Mark calling Jesus the Son of God in the very first verse of his gospel, and no human calls him the Son of God until a Roman centurion at the end of his crucifixion account. It's just demons. That's it. And so here we are looking at this story where the disciples end up asking this question about his identity, and their fear of death has been turned into a greater fear. They fear all the way through. In fact, if you start in verse um, 30, uh, uh, well, where did it go? You can help me out here. I'm looking for the first reference to fear, and I can't even find it in my own Bible. <laughs> Well, uh, anyway, at least you have the explicit reference in verse 41. They became very much afraid. And what, what Mark does here is this description of fear is a great fear. And so that's the third great in this story. You have, um, as you work through this story, there's a great fear in verse 41. There's a great calm. It's translated perfectly calm in verse um, 39. And there's a great storm. It's translated fierce gale in verse 37. But in 37, 39, and 41, it's great, great, great. And by the time you get to that last great, it's clear that their fear is a greater fear than the previous fear. They were afraid of dying. They were afraid that they were going to go down in the storm. And they were terrified because they were fearing death. And Jesus has to ask them about their lack of faith. And it starts to reveal that there's a greater fear here. And that's what's got to go. That's, what, that's the benefit for us in this story. As we work through this story, 
um, just be thinking, what are the implications? What are the implications of my conviction about the identity of this man who has the authority over nature? She cast out every fear. Let's pick it up in verse 35. On that day, the same day that he taught publicly, when evening came, he finishes a, an entire day of preaching from the boat. The boat was his pulpit. In verse 36, as I mentioned, it says, they took him just as he was. At that point, he says, let's go to the other side. So they're crossing over the, the Sea of Galilee. They're going over to the other side. The other side would have been notably a Gentile. There was a, a high level of a Gentile population on the other side. Um, it's still in the promised land. It's still in the 12 tribes. But nevertheless, it would have been viewed with some, somewhat uh, not as, as, as J Jewish as the west side. And Jesus says, let's go to the other side. It's important to recognize there's actually a pretty significant change in Jesus' min ministry at this particular point. At this particular point, Mark has already documented the unbelief of the religious leaders. He's been documenting the unbelief of the people. He starts speaking in parables to conceal truth and reveal truth, revealing truth to insiders, concealing truth from outsiders. His ministry has already had a judicial flavor to it because no, people aren't listening to him. They aren't submitting to him. They aren't worshiping him as God. At this particular point, after turning to parabolic preaching, where truth, the dimmer switch on truth for the public has been turned down to some degree. He goes over to the other side, and his ministry starts to have much more of a, a direct influence on the Gentile populations. You're going to see the Syrophoenician woman who gets saved. You're going to see not just Jesus feed 5,000 Jews, he feeds 4,000 Gentiles. So there's this increasing ministry to the Gentiles at this particular point in his ministry. And Mark kind of marks that transition right here with this reference to let's go to the other side. There's also a transition here, <coughs> excuse me, there's also a transition here between the moral lines being of clean and unclean. Um, the, the, it's not as though Jesus ever crosses some law. He never violates the Old Testament. He never breaks any of God's righteous standards. What happens, though, is he doesn't obliterate righteous standards. He actually um, goes into what's viewed as unclean either because of man-made tradition or because it's actually unclean by Old Testament law. And he starts either, he's either exposing the man-made nature of what is unclean in some of the Jewish traditions or his identity as the son of God who is coming to reverse the curse so reverses the curse in such a degree that it becomes impossible for him to actually be unclean. As I already mentioned, the demoniac lived among the tombs, among the dead, the demons then are sent into pigs. A, a, a woman is unclean due to her bleeding. She touches Jesus, and he doesn't become unclean. She becomes healed. Jesus touches the corpse of a dead girl, and he's not unclean. She rises from the dead. In chapter 7, he exposes the man-made traditions regarding purity and food. And then also in chapter 7, the unclean Gentile woman recognizes she's unclean. And she even says, don't even the dogs eat the scraps from your master's table? And Jesus says, wow, look at this faith. And so here he is transitioning kind of in his, in his focus, and he's, he's teaching the disciples about the nature of uh, the gospel and preparing them for the church age. So, verse 36, leaving the crowd, they leave them there. They took, him, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and the other boats go alongside them. They have a little convoy making their way across the Sea of Galilee. Verse 37, there arose a fierce gale. Again, a great storm, a great windstorm. And the waves um, were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up. Now, this is, a, this is an interesting little story here. Uh, you're, you're probably aware because of this story and because of the other stories, just how quickly storms would come up on the sea. We'll see it again in Mark chapter 6 when he walks on the water. He's walking in the middle of these storms. There's tremendous waves. What's interesting is, though, you think about the boats in, these, in, the, in those days. Um, if you've ever been to Israel, you've probably seen the, uh, in the Yigal Alon Museum, it's called the, the, um, the Ancient Galilee Boat. 
or some people call it Jesus's boat. And it's a, it's a boat, it's the whole of a boat, the frame of it. It was discovered in 1986, and it was a particularly dry year. And so the water levels in the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias there, Lake Gennesaret, it was particularly low. And so uh, some locals found this, this wood sticking out, and they started digging around, digging around, and they realized, oh, this is like, there's like a boat under here. And so they contacted some authorities, and they ended up finding out, wow, this is like a legit find. So they started to dig some of the mud away from the boat and cover it with foam to protect it where they could you know, can preserve it until they could get it into a lab and kind of dry it out and, and preserve whatever they could find, whatever they would have. Well, it's pretty well preserved. If you go there to that museum, you can see it. It's 26 and a half feet long. It's seven and a half feet wide. It's four and a half feet high. And that's the, ex- that's the extant height. If you look at it, you'll notice that the, the, the top uh, walls and edges of this hole have actually been completely eroded, and there's just no, it's, it's whatever was left at the mud level before 1986. And so you don't even have the full height of the side of that boat. Uh, experts have dated this thing, and it dates between 1st century and uh, B.C. and 1st century A.D., and so uh, it, it certainly is a, an excellent specimen of the type of boat that would have been, that would have been in this story. And what's impressive is how tall those, those boat walls are. I mean, this is not a you know, pontoon boat. This isn't a flat-bottom bass boat. I mean, this is like, it's got massive walls. And I'm no, I'm no expert in boats. I don't know necessarily what the displacement would have been or how high the finished wall would have been out of the, out of the water. But uh, it, it would take quite a wave to be coming over the top of this thing. The lake itself sits 600 feet below sea level, and now it's not salt water because it actually flows into the Dead Sea, which is even farther below sea level, obviously. But it's a freshwater, below sea level lake. And what's interesting is, is there's, there's mountains on all sides, hills on all sides, and then mountains further off in the distance. And so if you've been there, you've seen those steep banks on the east side where the demoniac was. But even um, um, pretty close by is Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is 9,200 feet above sea level. So from the surface of the lake to the top of Mount Hermon, you've got over 10,000 feet of, of difference in elevation. And what that does is that causes the, the cool air from the mountains to come flying down the mountain face and down those hillsides, in, down to the Sea of Galilee, and the warm air of this below sea level lake to start rising. And those things, that can create, that's just a perfect storm for a perfect storm. And so here comes this outbreak of this incredible windstorm, and it's already filling, over, filling up the boat. And what's amazing about this story is how many of the disciples are experienced fishermen, and this is their hometown lake. This is where they fish. This is where they make a living. They know this lake. They've seen what it can do. They know how to navigate it. I mean, this is like another day of driving the uh, Phoenix Freeway if you drive to work. It's just common everyday occurrence. This is no everyday storm. This fierce gale, gale rises, and while, while, the, while they're, they're sitting there realizing this is life-threatening, Jesus is still sleeping. Verse 38, he's, with the, he's in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and that would have been a cushion that you would sit on if you weren't, when you weren't fishing, when you weren't working, you just sit up in the stern on this, on this little cushion, and um, they woke him. They wake him up. And um, they say to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? I like uh, Moffat's paraphrase. It might, not, it might not be a precise translation, but I think it's an accurate paraphrase. Moffat says, teacher, are we to drown for all you care? I mean, it's just, you can just tell, they, they're willing to wake him up. They're, they're, they're scared that they're going to die. And it's almost like, are, are you literally unconcerned? The, the word has this idea of concern, care, concern, a burden. Is it no concern to you that we're perishing? You can't give two cents that we're about to die here? And, I mean, the, the storytelling is just incredible. I mean, you just, Mark just brings it alive, doesn't he? Verse 39. So he gets up, he rebukes the wind. He said, hush, be still. The wind died down and it became perfectly calm. Now, if I were just kind of creating the story, I'd kind of be like, I'd probably add maybe an exaggerated, like, rolling of the eyes. Oh, I gotta get up for this. Like, you guys, come on, seriously. 
Jesus just gets up. He complies with their concern. Rebukes the wind. Calms down immediately. Now, it's interesting that... um, Verse 39, this might have, this kind of surprised me, honestly. You know, he uses the word sea, and we're kind of used to the Sea of Galilee. And you'll see the word, you'll see the phrase Sea of Galilee uh, quite often. You've also heard like Lake Gennesaret, or you've probably even heard of the Sea of Tiberias. It's interesting to call this body of water a sea. It's surrounded by land. It's, it's uh, 17, seven miles by 13 miles. It's a lake. It's fresh water. It's interesting that um, you know a lot of a lot of contemporary writers call it a lake. Even Luke typically calls it a lake. Uh, Josephus, the the Jewish historian, calls it a lake. It's interesting that the the biblical writers tend to call it a sea, and they appeal to the Hebrew word yom, which means sea, Red Sea. Um, they use the word yom, and in, in the sea in the Old Testament is it's where it's it's pictured as um, judgment. If you die at the sea, that's a judgment. Um, it's the sea is where Satan, the serpent, the Leviathan comes from in Isaiah 27, I believe. It's interesting here, just thinking about how Mark is calling it the sea, and Jesus is just flat out silencing it. And I think that the emphasis, I think the tendency of the biblical writers to call it the sea is even instructive. Because clearly what's happening, starting in this story and moving through the next three stories, is Jesus is in the process of just demonstrating his power to reverse the curse. In verse 39, he shows personal power and authority over a cursed nature. Okay, there's a reason why when you go hiking in a national park, it says don't feed the bears, keep your windows up, whatever. It's like wild animals are still killing people. We do not have dominion over this earth. We don't rule it. It's wild, it's dangerous, people still die in tornadoes, they still die in hurricanes, they still die in mudsides, they still die in tsunamis. Animals are still killing people. Christ has authority over the fallen, cursed earth. The fallen, cursed world. This is a potentially fatal storm, and he just says, hush, be silent, and it's over. It obeys. Inanimate objects, mother nature is totally subservient to Christ's power and authority. And have you noticed that these miracles all have the same flavor? Have you ever noticed that he's going to cast a demon out of a man. He's going to heal a woman who's bleeding because of disease. He's going to raise someone from the dead because those are all effects of the curse. He is reversing the curse. His healing miracles go one direction. They go from uh, demise to health. They go from danger to safety. They go from a cursed version to the created version. Have you ever wondered why he doesn't... um, Show, show his power by, you know, just doing some Jedi mind trick and pointing at some house and causing it to just levitate and spin around a few times and set it back down. Couldn't he? Sure. But what would that prove? That he can do that? Well, of course he can do that. He doesn't need to prove that. What he's proving is that he is the son of God And now, through Jesus Christ, dominion over this earth will be restored through him. Adam was given dominion. He lost it. We've never had it. Christ alone has dominion over the earth among all mankind. That's why this makes it such a paper plastic moment. It's like Suddenly, the, the, the right and to rule and the power of, of om, omnipotence has only been in the hands of God, and now they're seeing it in the hands of a man, Jesus of Nazareth. It's profound. It's so profound. He just speaks to the wind, and it obeys. It became a great calm. So the great storm in verse 37 becomes a great calm in verse 39. And here comes the rebuke. 
In verse 40, he said to them, why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? That's an interesting question. Um, when I looked at that this week, I, I, I started asking myself, okay, when I think of faith, typically my default way to think about that is you take God at his word. Faith is taking God at his word. Or you might like the acronym, forsaking all, I trust him. Self-abandonment, taking God at his word. You come under what he said. Faith isn't a creative power. Faith is not, I have this, I believe this, so therefore I make it happen. That's, that's word faith. That's just totally satanic. That makes faith not a taking God at his word, trusting in his power. That's something that I actually exert, which I don't have, by the way. I have a faith that, just by, that God gave me, which just says, I'm going to take God at his word. I'm going to trust him. He's powerful. I want to do what he said. And when I got to this question, how is it that you have no faith? The question would be, well, what, what are they not trusting? Where's that verse that says, when the waves are coming over the four and a half foot side of the hole of your boat and you're about to drown, don't fear. I mean, has, has, has there never been such a thing as a, a Christian who's drowned before? So what's the faith issue? The issue here is, it goes right to the heart of the entire book. The identity of Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Notice in verse 40, the first question is, why are you afraid? This is the fear that we've been talking about. It's a fear that is, it will lead to compromise. It's a fear that will cause you to disobey. It's a fear that will take you out of the game of being faithful and following Jesus Christ on the path to discipleship. This is not going to be the first time we come across this fear. I mean, this is the first time we come across it. It's not the last time we come across it. So we see the word fear in verse 40. We see that they became very much afraid in verse 41, and that's not okay. This is not a, kind, a good kind of fear. They shouldn't become very much afraid. They should actually be trusting. So their faithlessness is producing this fear. It was a fear of death in verses 35 to 38, and now it becomes this greater fear, namely a fear about the implications of Christ's identity. They should be believing that instead of being afraid. Let me show this to you. Uh, Mark uses the word fear, fearful, or afraid several times, about a dozen times in his gospel. And I want to just kind of give you a survey. And this is your, I'm going to try to be quick on this, but I want to sh show it to you in somewhat systematic fashion because, first of all, we are going to get to these other passages. So I don't have to be exhaustive here, but I also don't want you to just think I'm just inserting something into Mark chapter 4 that is not where Mark is taking us. Okay, so let's just do this kind of systematically. Let's just work through these references. The first one is in 540. The next, that's where he says, why are you afraid? The next one is in 541, they became very much afraid. Now, let's skip over to chapter 5, and we see it again in verse 33. Here, this woman who was, had the, the hemorrhaging, she was convinced that she would be healed if she touched him, and he says, who touched me in 31? He looks around to see the woman, uh, to see the woman who had done this, but the woman fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down. She's, she's terrified. She's like, I didn't have permission to do that. Uh, ew, what happened? This, this could go south. I'm getting called out here. And then, of course, he's very kind. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your affliction. What's interesting, though, is you skip to the next story, and it goes back to the, the story within the story here. It ends with the um, synagogue ruler. In verse 36, Jesus was overhearing... Um, the people from his house who were saying, don't bother the teacher anymore, your daughter's already dead. So he overhears that, and he says to the synagogue official, don't be afraid any longer, only believe. And you can see how, how can directly connected that is. This synagogue ruler was afraid, and he should have been believing. Just don't be afraid anymore, you, you should just be believing. This fear is antithetical to faith. Skip over to chapter 6. Next time you see this word group, in verse 20, Herod was afraid of John. Herod was afraid of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a man of conviction. He preached what was true. He didn't care what people thought. He didn't care about the consequence. And Herod knew that. I mean, he had him in prison. And um, the guy was just fearless. And uh, he knew that he was a righteous and a holy man, and so he kept him safe. And um, 
he, he, he was scared of him. I mean, the guy, John's like literally rebuking him over his previous divorce and then his marriage to his brother's wife. And so John's rebuking him for his sin, calling him to repent. And um, he was afraid of John the Baptist. That's not a reverence. He, he didn't listen. He wasn't about to listen to what he said, but he was scared. He knew enough to be scared. The next time we see it is in 650. Chapter 6, verse 50. Let's pick it up in 49. When they, the disciples, saw Jesus walking on the sea, they supposed that it was a ghost, and they cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke with them and said to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. So in other words, be courageous, don't fear. The issue is, if we had faith, we would be courageous, not fearful. Courage. We would be convinced. We would be confident. We would be courageous. Nothing would derail us from following after Christ. Fears would be cast out and silenced. Mark chapter 9, verse 32. Skip over to 932. This one, I do want to just take a little... These next two are really, really important, so I'm going to take a brief comment, take a, take a couple minutes here and just explain this for a second. We're, we're diving into a section of Mark where the disciples are kind of, they're, they're, they're seeing a little bit of Christ's identity, but they're not seeing it completely. So as we'll find out, the, the healing of the man that's healed in stages is, is actually a word picture. It's actually an, a, a word picture and a metaphor for the disciples. So Jesus heals in stages. That's the only time he doesn't heal entirely in one shot, is in chapter 8. He heals a man. He says, can you see? He says, like, I see, looks like trees. I, it's like, I think it's men. I, it, it looks like a tree, but it's a man. It's, it's walking like a man. So he's, he clearly can't see totally. He can see partially. And so his vision has been somewhat restored, but it's not a clear vision. And then Jesus heals him entirely, and he's able to see normally. And so here in this section, we're seeing the disciples with this increasing clarity still step all over themselves because they're missing the implications of Christ's identity. In verse 32, it says, but they did not understand this statement, and they were afraid to ask him. Okay, that's an important, important use of the word fear here. Why is that so important? I find this totally fascinating, totally compelling, and so instructive for us as Christians. They were not afraid to ask him earlier in the chapter. So let's look at what happened. If you go back to chapter 9, verse 9, this is coming down the mountain after the Mount of Transfiguration. So you remember, Jesus goes up on the mountain. It's like he kind of just unzips his humanity and just showcases divine nature exclusively on the top of the Mount, uh, of, the mount of Transfiguration. They're coming down from that experience. Verse 9 he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. So he's telling them, don't talk about this experience until I rise from the dead. Okay, well, that obviously, you know, when's that going to happen? They might not know, but the fact that he's going to die, I mean, that's obviously, he just said it. So just don't talk about it until after I've risen from the dead. I'm going to die. Verse 10, they seized upon that statement discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. Not a complicated phrase, but it's theologically mind-blowing if you're not paying attention to the prophecies of the Old Testament. And so they think, well, this is the Messiah. He's going to rule and he's going to reign and he's going to rise from the dead. I mean, obviously that doesn't, you know, I, what? So they're having this argument about what that phrase means because it's just not fitting their, some of their preconceived notions. At this point, they're all excited about Jesus being the Messiah. They're all excited about Jesus being the king of Israel. They're all excited about red carpet. They're all excited about not having to pay taxes to Rome anymore. They asked him, verse 11, they asked him. In verse 11, they were not afraid to ask. Okay, so this, that's, that's so helpful. They are not afraid to ask because they believe Jesus has made a mistake. Watch this. Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And so now they're alluding to a prophecy in the book of Malachi, and they're looking at this prophecy thinking, okay, Malachi comes back, and then, and then comes the Messiah, the, the, the Lord whom you seek. He's coming to his temple, and then there's going to be national revival, and then comes the end. I mean, this is, this is golden. Awesome. Love it. So Jesus is talking about this rising from the dead bit, 
He needs to be reminded of some of the prophecies he must have forgotten. He said to them, well, sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has come. And they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of him. Again, he's referring back to John the Baptist, who has already had his head cut off. And the answer to the question, is, Jesus, is, Elijah John, is, is John the Baptist Elijah? The answer to that question is, if you choose to accept it, they didn't accept it. They killed him. He came in the spirit and power of Elijah. He came in the function of, his, of Elijah. They didn't accept it. And they rejected him. And Jesus just fills out their theology with the reality and the truths of the Old Testament. And they realized, oof, I guess that means it's not red carpet right now. Huh. I, suddenly following Christ just got a little bit harder. Hmm. Well, that rebuke didn't go well. And so you get to chapter 9, verse 30, and they, they go out through Galilee, and he didn't want anybody to know about it, where he was at. Um, the, verse 31, he was teaching his disciples, telling them the Son of Man is to be delivered in the hands of men. They will kill him, and when he's been killed, he'll rise three days later. They don't press in. They don't ask for more clarification. They don't come humbly and say, you know, last time we thought he got it wrong. Hey, teach us about that. Explain to that. Show us what, how that works with these prophecies. We want to learn. We want to know. We want to follow you. We want more truth. We want more clarity. We want more understanding. None of that. They just were afraid to ask. Suddenly, when Christ is on his way to Jerusalem, and he's on his way to die, following Christ as a disciple is a lot harder. Fear would prevent you from following. Chapter 10, verse 32. They were on the road going to, up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them, and they, they were amazed. And those who followed were fearful. Okay, note that. Jesus is on the road. He's going toward Jerusalem. They, they, he, three times he's predicted his, suffer, his, his suffering. The third, well, actually, the third time is in the next two verses. This is the third time he's predicted his sufferings and his death and his resurrection. And they're amazed. They're shocked that he just keeps going, knowing that that's what awaits for him in Jerusalem. And those who are following him are fearful. And so it's like they're following, and it's almost like they're getting slower and slower. Like, let's just get some more mile markers between us and Jesus, you know? This is just not okay. I'm not comfortable with this. And their fear is going to cause them to compromise. Well, fast forward for a second to chapter 10, verse 51. I want to contrast Bartimaeus with the disciples for a second. The disciples are following Jesus on the road to Jerusalem, and they're fearful, getting more distance between him and them because of their fear, and they're not growing in faith. In verse 51, uh, Jesus is answering Bartimaeus, and he says, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, I want to gain, regain my sight. And Rabboni is just a, t a respectful label. It literally would mean my teacher. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately, he regained his sight and began following him on the road. The disciples are on that same road, and they're getting fearful, amazed and shocked, more distanced. I don't know about following him on this road. This is really difficult. And here comes blind Bartimaeus, and he's just like, I know you're the son of David. He gives him sight. He sees clearly, and not just physically. He sees clearly spiritually. He's like, of course I'm going to follow you on the road to Jerusalem. You're my Lord. I'm your disciple. And he's just fearless. What a rebuke Bartimaeus was to the disciples at this point. We'll skip a few 
but just jump to the last one. Chapter 16. Chapter 16. Mark's instructive storytelling capabilities were never better than they were how he ended his gospel. Um, he ended it in one of the, just such a shocking way. And that's why if you look at your English Bible, you'll see um, several different endings that, were, that have been um, you know, documented in various manuscripts throughout, throughout the history of, of manuscript evidence, but they were, they were added later. And so where Mark ended his gospel is in verse 8. The final story, and it's so abrupt that it makes sense, just kind of begging to get stories added to it, it makes sense. But it's very abrupt. It ends with the, the women coming to, um, to anoint him at the tomb. In verse 5, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And they said to him, uh, he said to them, sorry, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He's not here. Behold, this is the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. End of the story. And you're left looking at the human response to this, the biography of the Son of God. Is someone going to believe this? Is someone going to have courage? That's the impact. That's what's supposed to happen when you finish the story that way. Let's go back to this first encounter here, the first uh, instance of fear in our story in Mark chapter 4. They're scared of the storm. They're scared of dying. But then they become very much afraid when he calms the storm. And he says, why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? Don't you believe? Don't you believe I'm the son of God? Don't you believe I'm the son of David? Don't you believe I'm the Messiah? Don't you believe I'm here to reverse the curse? Don't you believe I have authority over nature, demons, disease, death? So verse 41 says, then they became greatly afraid. They literally, they feared with great fear. They feared with great fear, and they said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea Obey him. You think, well, why are they asking that question? I mean, don't they know who it is? Well, they're, they're coming to grips with it, but it's going to take them another six chapters, even by the time you get to chapter 11, and they're still coming to grips with it in many senses. But they're coming to grips slowly, but it's just telling them. This is one of the most honest moments from the disciples. They're like, who, like how do we get our minds around this? What's happening here? This is the Son of God. Do, do we believe that? Or do we believe that when it suits us and it, it's an application of what we believe the Son of God should be and should do for us? You might look at this and think, well, we shouldn't have high expectations on the disciples. We shouldn't expect them to get to this point in the story and just say, oh, yeah, I totally get that he's the Messiah and his, his role is beyond superior firepower over Caesar. Oh, that would just be unfair to the disciples to have that at this point. Well, if it weren't for the Old Testament, they should have expected divine power and divine rule to be exerted, to be established, and that a man, a son of Adam, who was son of God, would come and reverse the curse. I mean, Psalm 8, is that, that's simply saying that. What is man and the son of man? You would subjugate earth to him. And why else would the author of Hebrews say, yeah, and yet we don't yet see that happening because still we see tsunamis and mudslides and bears and we see a, a earth that is cursed and there's still wars and there's still militaries. So yeah, of course we don't see Psalm 8 fulfilled yet. But the son of man is the son of God. They're one and the same person and he has the power to reverse the curse. As I mentioned, these 
mount powers and the miracles that Jesus exerted. They don't, they don't ride on shock value. They don't ride on the fact that it's just something they've never seen before. This isn't um, Jesus playing like a superhero and just doing amazing, you know, kind of uh, signs and wonders that would happen, you know, just pre-CGI, just before computer graphics. He just was a couple generations before that and just did it without the computers. No, it's very specific. It's all connected to the effects of sin. He's reversing sin and the effects of sin and guilt and the curse, everything having to do with the fall, everything that separates man from God, everything that's second rate from God's design as it was originally intended to be, It's, it's pretty fascinating to get to this story and read Jesus say, be still. That's a very familiar phrase to us, isn't it? What comes next? Be still and know that I am God. It's hard not to wonder if Psalm 46 wasn't in Mark's mind when he wrote this story. I want to turn your attention to Psalm 40, 46, and I want to read that. This will also, I'm going to kind of read this from just before we close in prayer. And, and what's so helpful about Psalm 46 is that it's, a, it's, it's one of those Old Testament passages that talks about fear, but it's not, a, it's not talking about fear in the virtuous sense of fear. It's talking about fear in the same way that Mark is talking about fear, which is a compromise, a lack of faith. And so if you remember... Um, and we're going all the way back to the beginning. The be still passage is in verse 10. But we're going to go all the way back to the beginning because verse 2 says, therefore we will not fear. So this is talking about a fearlessness, a courage that should characterize Christians. It should characterize God's children. And as I read this, uh, I think this will be a benefit to us as we think about the lesson we must learn from the story of the calming of the sea. The question is, are we marked by fear or faith? Christian, are you marked by fear or faith? Is your life characterized by courage or timidity? Is your life marked by fear or faith? Follow along with me, Psalm 46. The inscription says, For the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah, set to Alamot a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear though the earth should change, and though the mountains should slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. Selah. And there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar. The kingdoms, they tottered. He raised his voice, or literally, he gave his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolations in the earth. He makes wars to cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving or be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this recording and giving us this, the story of, of these disciples. It really, the story of the calming of the sea is a story about the disciples, because that's where our instruction comes from. And seeing their confusion and seeing the, the struggle that they had, the questions that they ask here, who, who are you? Who, who is this identity of this individual who has power over wind and wave and nature itself? And looking at even future uh, stories in Mark where, where the disciples were scared to ask questions and they were scared to press in, Lord, we, we, we probably all uh, resonated with some of those accounts, thinking about how the fear that is that is re reflects a lack of faith has so often caused us compromise in our following after you. 
Lord, there are so many threats to our following you, to our discipleship. If we're going to follow you on the way, like Bartimaeus and not like the disciples, we, we need more faith. Lord, we, we do believe, but help our unbelief. We pray that you would strengthen our faith, strengthen our confidence in you, our, our awareness of who you are and your promises, and that this would counteract all the timidity that would take us out of, out of this incredible process called discipleship. We want to follow you, and we want to follow you all the way of your commands, all the way down every path that you've ever given us. There's threats in our culture. There's threats in, our, in some of our homes. There's threats in our schools. There's threats in our society. There are, thing, there are so many things to be scared of that would, be a, that would reflect a fear that is faithless. Lord, help our unbelief. As your people, we pray that our faith would triumph over all these threats, and we just want to be faithful that we would follow after you. We have not yet resisted to the shedding of blood, and until that happens, Lord, increase our faith and strengthen it so that we would follow you uh, to the end. I pray that there would be no cost, no comfort that we wouldn't be willing to give up I pray that we would not even count our lives as dear to ourselves if only for the prospect of fulfilling the the calling and the ministry of preaching the gospel of your grace. I pray, Lord, that we would be strong. I want to pray for even every Christian in this church and especially the younger generation. Strengthen them. Cause their faith to rise. If it became illegal to have this meeting publicly to open up your scriptures or to preach truths that have been determined by legislation to be politically incorrect, I pray that you would strengthen the young generation of your church to stand. We need more faith because the cost is always going to be great. And we love the prospect of following you on the path of discipleship. So Lord, we pray that you'd help us. In your name we pray this. Amen.